Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for Lab Live number three, brought to you by Lab Innovations. Um, for those of you that are new with us today and don't know me, my name is Katie Gray um, and I'm the marketing manager for Lab Innovations. So I think we've got quite a few um, international people joining us today, which is really exciting. So welcome. Um, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Lawrence Dawkins Hall, um, who is a professional registration support mentor for the Science Council. Um, and he's also a teaching technician at the University of Leicester's Cancer Centre. Um, Lawrence has, I think, over 30 years of experience working um, uh, as a technician. And what I learned this week is that you also worked in New York and Germany, I think, Lawrence. So that's pretty cool. Yes. Lawrence spoke at Lab Innovations last year. Um, and I remember during his talk, he mentioned that, uh, I think he said, the statistic at the time was 50,000 technicians are retiring um, and something like seven, 700,000 technicians will be required in the next decade to deal with the sort of the aging population of technicians. Um, so today Lawrence is going to share his knowledge and talk a little bit more about that. Um, he'll be sort of going over the recruitment crisis of UK technicians um, and he'll also discuss the technician's commitment and the benefits of professional registration for the UK workforce. So just before I hand it over to Lawrence, um, I just want to run through a few housekeeping issues. So you'll see on the right hand side, we have a chat tab, a questions tab and a polls tab. So feel free to chat amongst yourselves. You can ask questions in the questions tab um, and we'll be sending out some polls throughout Lawrence's talk. So you can answer those polls and then we'll sort of have a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, there is an audio button just up here, should be to the top right hand side of your screen. Um, every time someone puts a comment in the chat function, that pings. So if that's annoying, you can just um, mute that. And I think that's everything. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Lawrence. OK, thank you, Katie. So good morning, everybody. My name's Lawrence Dawkins Hall. Thanks for that introduction, Katie. Um, I'm actually here in my capacity as an applicant support mentor for the Science Council. And let me start by saying that as an applicant support mentor for the Science Council, I'm involved in probably what is the seminal aspect of supporting and redressing some of the problems with technicians and technician recruitment uh, and retention that I'm going to talk about today. And that's the initiative of professional registration. I'll say as well, sort of elaborating on what Katie said, is that I've been a technician um, for 30 years now, and I've worked in various biomedical sciences fields and in various um, disciplines. Um, and not only that, I've worked in Germany as a technician and New York. And so that's sort of given me, um, if you like, a lot of insight into changes that have happened, some of which are good, but not all of which are good, as I'll talk about now in the sort of ensuing 30 years. And I would say particularly since the 90s, but also I think working in Germany and New York has actually given me an insight into the way that things are done in other countries, good and bad. So my talk is therefore entitled 21st Century uh, Technicians. Um, it's really broken into three parts, challenges, insights and innovations. The challenge really is the recruitment crisis and also for extant technicians in the field, retaining them. OK. Um, and so in response to that and the fact that the UK, like a lot of sort of first world countries, is becoming increasingly technological, knowledge based economies, as they're called, there's an imperative to recruit people, including technicians, that have the sorts of skills um, that industry requires to actually keep the co economy in the 21st century running in a 21st century context. So Insights really refers to reports that the government and another organisation sort of whose funding is underpinned by... Um, whose funding is underpinned by the Sainsbury organization, the Sainsbury organization, sorry about that, um, the Gatsby Foundation is sort of looking at the problem. Uh, innovations really refers to, um, innovations really refers to, sorry about this, 
I keep getting a call that won't go away. Innovations really refers to um, sort of what is going on in terms of um, changes in vocational training up until about 21, but also in professional environments, higher education and industry as a whole, in terms of things that are needed to ensure that technicians are equipped to do the job competently and in a way that most benefits society. OK, and that is something referred to as the technician commitment. And I'll go into that later in the talk. So that really frames the talk, hence the three parts. The other thing I'd say is I'll preface my actual talk by saying that as an applicant support mentor, I talk in detail a lot about um, professional registration and I go actually into the nitty gritty of what you need to do to actually successfully apply for professional registration. And I've said to Charlie and Katie of Easy Fair that this talk is really sort of an introduction. It sets the scene, the problems and the innovations. And my expectation is that I will follow this workshop with more bespoke detailed workshops where I describe the sort of nuances, the sort of nitty gritty of how to fill out this thing called the competency form, which is the mainstay of applying for professional registration via CAP. And one of the questions that I think has already gone live is, would you be receptive to me actually uh, giving such uh, more bespoke talks? OK, I think I said enough about the first slide, so let's move on. OK, so here's the thing. This, these are three slides that sort of highlight the importance of technicians and some of the extant challenges. Um, there are currently something like, in a UK context, 1,500,000 technicians working in all industries, OK, supporting and underpinning them. But here's the thing. Three quarters of large firms have identified basically skill gaps, specialist knowledge and information that they would require from technicians in their workforce. In fact, not just technicians, uh, skilled sort of practitioners in general. Um, and if you look at small businesses, missing key skills um, is actually a problem for 96 percent of them. OK, and here's another salient statistics, as Katie said, um, Basically, we need to replace 70,000 qualified technicians each year. Something like 50 to 70,000 are retiring, retiring and not being replaced. So if you do the maths, that's where the 700,000 shortfall comes from in a decade's time. So let's just think just for a second about, um, let's just reflect on what is actually causing that okay and i think one of the seminal problems is the fact that the landscape of technical training is refused with no accountability or standards okay um government audits have discovered there's a mismatch between skills offered through vocational courses and what is actually required um not only that but in stem subjects um eight percent of persons are pursuing vocational qualifications at level four and five. In contrast, 30 percent are actually pursuing academic degrees, which give you a general foundation, but don't necessarily give you the skills or even the requisite knowledge required to actually fulfill an active and productive role in industry. Then there is a lack of focus on vocational courses, and that is due to the fact that in the current landscape, more than 50 percent of level four and five, which is where they tend to sit in terms of educational um, level, 50% of level four and five of vocational courses are actually offered by primarily colleges of further ed education, who in the main are divorced from industry. And actually something only like 2% of accredited training is provided by industry. And of course, it's industry that knows what it needs. And so there's a there's there's basically a confused landscape and a disconnect between the people offering vocational training and actually industry itself and its associated needs. In addition to that, there's a problem of investment. OK, so to grow the UK economy, OK, in a knowledge based fashion, 
the UK has committed to investing something like 2.4% of GDP in research and development um, by 2027. Okay. And that equates to increasing the number of personnel in research and development by 200,000 in the same time period. And of course, technicians will be a viable part of that mix. And as we move progressively towards a knowledge-based economy, it's therefore important that we address the actual skills and knowledge that technicians have um, and they therefore take into their workplace in order to ensure that this deficit of skills and knowledge that I've just referred to um, is actually um, addressed. There's a problem of job security with technicians as well. So there's a there's a problem with training. OK, there's a problem potentially with investment going forward, particularly um, with the sorts of debts we're running up right now. It, I wonder how these sums will actually add up. OK, but there are other sort of salient problems as well, which are really, I think, um, sort of technician specific in some senses. And so. There's a problem of security and, and, the, and the analogy I've given you is snakes and ladders. So what can happen is that many uh, technicians or, or although actually this is true of postdoctoral scientists as well. Many technicians, if they're lucky, um, will get promoted through the ranks by virtue of having grants renewed by their PIs and they will actually go up in terms of their scale. Um, but then what will happen, and this is the vicissitudes of the funding model of science in general, and this has happened to me a number of times over the years, is that grants aren't renewed. They um, they actually lose their job. And even if they manage to get back in on another grant somewhere else, they might actually fail to secure a position at the level they were at before. And just to put, put that in a personal and academic context, Many, act many academic technicians are employed at something like band five and the number above band five, band six, seven and eight, when it comes to technical staff in the UK, there's a paucity of those positions outside, say, London and Cambridge, um, the Golden Triangle, London, Oxford and Cambridge, um, in comparison to positions at, say, level five and six. So I've been in a position where in Manchester, I was there for nine years. It was a good time for funding in the 90s, and I've seen it decline subsequently from a personal perspective. OK, so I managed to go from band five to band seven. Then basically I changed contracts uh, for personal reasons, and I was only able to attain um, a job at band five. So I lost something like £10,000 in pay through no fault of my own. And so I think one of the imperatives in terms of addressing the recruitment crisis with Technicians, it is a feature of, for instance, postdoctoral scientists to, as well, but I'm here primarily to talk about technicians today, is to provide job security. And so even when technicians are not losing their jobs, this attrition I talked about, some of them, when they hit 30 and they maybe want to start families and have mortgages, they see the writing on the wall. And the number of technicians I've actually seen deliberately leave a contract that's still open and go, for instance, into secondary school teaching. Um, so that is exacerbating this drain, not just retirement, but the technicians choosing to leave to secure uh, better funded uh, jobs uh, with more of a career structure. And I guess secondary school teaching would be a good example of that. And one from a personal perspective, I've seen many technicians actually jump ship from research in higher education into secondary school teaching. Okay. So technicians, as a result, are aging. I think the figure, as you can see here, is 70,000 are retiring uh, every year. Um, and that means there's a progressively aging population. So if you do the maths, there's going to be a current for shortfall of 700,000 that I've mentioned. So the other thing that I'll point out in this slide is the fact that if you look, therefore, at the age uh, distribution of technicians and this is broken down for both biosciences chemistry engineering and physics so essentially stem you can see that the predominant age groups are 40 to 60 and there's a paucity of young people and that is a problem there's also a problem of um, perception okay and i think this is 
this has progressively become more so since the 90s. OK, and there are reasons for that that I'll elaborate on on the next slide. But this little cartoon here shows technicians busy working away at the, at the bench and a perplexed professor saying, I do not understand how this lab produces so much high quality reserves when it's full of bottle washers. OK, so there is this problem as what what technicians do. And I think increasingly what they actually do, because more and more of them on hefty, permanently funded contracts are being pushed into this menial, into these sort of more routine roles. They're less involved in skilled specialist science. OK, so it's a problem of perception. But I would actually argue that since the 90s, it's increasingly becoming a problem of reality. And if I take myself um, about five years ago, I let I elected to go from a grant uh, funded research technician where you're on a grant. There's a finite time period and there's a fight. And in that finite time period, you have specific goals technically to meet. So it's sort of obligatory, therefore, that you would actually be involved in quite a lot of skilled bench work. OK, skilled wet science. And then because I'm out now in my mid 50s, if I'm going to sort of give away my age. So I'm in the age group that there's um, that's starting to dominate science. Um, basically, what happened was I elected to take a hefty um, funded position. And what is happening with those positions is those technicians with a reduction in hefty funding, in other words, money from central government rather you know via things like the higher educational funding council and so increasingly those technicians that were once involved in research are now becoming the actual um bottle washers and um tidy uppers in the lab because there simply isn't enough technicians to actually support the labs and concomitantly and independently perform research themselves so Kelly Veer, for example, in who is really um, the sort of face of the technician's commitment within the UK, she wrote an article in which she described technicians of the Cinderella's of science. So sadly, the perception, if you like, is becoming reality. And what's therefore happening is that technicians more and more, particularly permanent funded technicians, hefty funded technicians are being pushed into these essential but you could argue less skilled role and that includes myself and a lot of the tasks that were being done by not just grant maintained technicians but skilled work undertaken in the past and i refer to the 90s from my own experience hefty funded technicians is now being done by research assistants so this is actually creating another uh, problem or rather it's reinforcing the perception that particularly hefty funded technicians are people that essentially just wash, do the washing up, make the medium, um, look after the equipment in the lab for people like postdocs and research assistants to actually do the real science. And so it's starting to de-skill these technicians, older technicians primarily like myself in permanent positions. OK. So um, one of the things that we have to recognize, and this is where we get on to the insights, is that technicians are vital scientists, okay? So this has been creeping up since the 90s, okay? Um, the fact that technicians are vital scientists and should be vital scientists, and the Gatsby Foundation, in conjunction with, uh, in conjunction with central government, has commissioned various people to actually look at the problem. So I think that the problem is known, particularly for people inside the industry, but it's actually getting a handle on the numbers. What is the magnitude of the shortfall? What is the magnitude of technicians becoming progressively de-skilled? And somebody that's been seminal in that regard is somebody called Paul Lewis, um, who is in the uh, Department of Political Economy at King's College in uh, London. Um, and he... Um, has actually um, talked about the fact that technicians are vital to a fully functioning innovation system, possessing an unparalleled combination of practical and theoretical knowledge. 
And that, I think, is the key to what a technician can offer, because anyone that's worked as a technician side by side with people who are, particularly in higher education, focused on um, sort of uh, their project work, their sort of knowledge and aptitude and sometimes even interest is geared towards um, theoretical models, their, their model of, say, cancer or whatever. And it's actually technicians that, if you like, possess the artisan skills in terms of the actual functioning of the analytical equipment, the platforms, OK, that actually cause the lab to function. OK, and that knowledge um, and it is a problem is being lost. Technicians are retiring, they're losing. And all of a sudden, the um, cell sorter machine. Oh, dear, we can't we can't actually operate that anymore. So this is a problem that practical skills are being lost from individual institutions and the wider economy as a whole. And as we move towards a practically based, knowledge-based economy, that's obviously going to have an impact. So what Paul Lewis has done, talking to, say, the funders, the movers and shakers, the people that can make a difference, is the fact that we need to recognise that technicians are or should be skilled workers, critical to the adoption and use of new technologies. Um, hitherto, as I've just said, and this is becoming more of a problem since the 90s, there is this notion that knowledge involved in innovation is the exclusive preserve of highly educated. And by that, you're normally referring to somebody um, with a PhD, educated scientists and engineers who pursue an academic type career. OK. So what's to be done? Well, I think, to be honest, um, there is there is a need to forge a clearer path for technical careers. OK, you have to address this existential crisis of recruitment um, and also loss of technicians through choosing to leave and retiring. So this was a, an article published in Nature uh, by Kelly Veer, sort of setting that out and talking about the problems that technicians face with a lack of career structure. And I'll come back to that in a second in terms of something, an initiative called the Technician's Commitment. And then we have Paul Lewis, who's talking about raising the profile of technicians. A number of reports, OK. So one of the things that Paul Lewis recommends is a complete reform of vocational training. At the moment, the landscape is very confusing. Standard courses by accredited providers with links to industry conforming to specific standards and matched to employers' needs are not being implemented. And that's really what's needed. OK, and this is beginning now to happen. This is part of the innovation with regard to sort of pre-university training with the introduction of T-levels at 16 and new style of apprenticeships at that age. Um, and the other thing that Paul Lewis says is that greater consideration needs to be given to technicians in the innovation system and emergence of new technologies. So I quote from this report here, Technicians and Innovation, a literature review, where Paul writes, policy makers need to ensure that apprenticeships and other forms of training develop, develop the broad occupational competence and underpinning knowledge so that techs can assist in the deployment and development of new technologies. Then he goes on to say, in terms of collaboration, centers of education excellence, such as the New Institute of Technology, should work with centers of innovation, such as the high value manufacturing catapult, to develop courses on emerging technologies. In other words, in a nutshell, making sure that the training is of a high standard, uh, is accountable, perhaps most importantly, however, that things like T-levels and new style apprenticeships are actually relevant to what industry requires. OK. So I've talked about the fact that um, there are educational reforms um, sort of in the offing. OK, we have the inception of T-levels. We have new style apprenticeships. But what about a little bit further up the pipeline? What about technicians as a whole that are already within the workplace? OK, now um, there is something called a technician commitment. OK, and the technician commitment is actually um, funded by um, something called 
uh, the Gatsby organization. And ultimately, that money comes from the Sainsbury's Foundation, Lord Sainsbury and his family. And the Gatsby Foundation and their, therefore, by extension, uh, Lord Sainsbury and his family are involved in various initiatives, such as what I've just been discussing, um, education with regard to technicians. But they're also involved in um, technical careers themselves. And the part of Gatsby that specifically looks at um, technician careers is something called Technicians Make It Happen. And Technicians Make It Happen, OK, as the representative of Gatsby, in conjunction with something called the Science Council, are rolling out this initiative called the Technician Commitment. And this is to ensure status and opportunity, in essence, for technical roles across the UK in research, teaching and innovation. OK, so higher education, industry as a whole. All right. And there are really four seminal pillars which constitute the technician commitment. The first is recognition. OK, I think hitherto this has been very hit and miss. Recognition. Technicians often feel unrecognized. OK, and you have thus far, you've had the situation in the UK where recognition um, has been primarily a result, if you're engaging in academic research, of um, actually uh, getting your name on a paper, okay. But that's very much at the um, behest of your uh, line manager, okay. And there are some line managers that um, just refuse to acknowledge or recognize technicians as co-authors on papers. And I would say, as an old hand at this, that that has become increasingly a problem. And by that, I mean that I think it happened more in the 90s. And I think the name of the game in terms of recognition in that regard should be the fact that we almost turn the clock back to those uh, times. Career development, OK. Um, giving technicians a palpable career path in terms of being able to progress up the career ladder, OK, to go from one grade to another in the way that at least some academics have the opportunity to do, not all, but some. Making sure that technicians are visible, OK, having open days, promoting what technicians do, things like the Science Council and the Gatsby. Obviously, forums like this promote what technicians do. And by implication, some of the things that still need to be done in order to increase the visibility and improve conditions for technicians in general. But really what I'm going to talk about and what actually I'm more of an expert on as an applicant support mentor for the Science Council in particular is a new initiative. OK, so hitherto recognition has primarily been synonymous with being an author on a paper. OK, but that's capricious. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And increasingly so, it's not happening. So there's a real problem there that technicians are not being recognized. And by extension, they remain under the radar. They're not visible. OK. And so there's this new initiative, OK, referred to as professional registration. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more in this second half of the talk. OK. But just before I move on to um, that second pillar of the te technician commitment as a whole, let me just say that I found this soundbite from Richard Branson, which I think in terms of ethos sums up the technician uh, quite well, which is you should train people well enough so that they can leave, but treat them well enough so that they actually don't want to. And I think that's quite a nice soundbite, which really sums up what the aspiration of the technician commitment should be. And that's going to involve not just technicians themselves pushing themselves forward, but funding bodies um, and also um, the actual um, PIs and leaders in um, academia and industry, respectively, as well. So the technician commitment, as I say, is really sponsored by Gatsby, this organisation that's funded by the Sainsbury's Foundation. And on behalf of Gatsby, it's really sort of orchestrated and promulgated by the Science Council. But there are a number of key sponsors, OK, linked to this. And as you can see, you've got government uh, funding bodies such as UK Research and Innovation, Research England and a number of major players like the Wellcome Trust and the Medi Medical Research Council, in addition to um, organisations actually at the ground face itself, such as uh, major Russell Group universities like King's College London, 
but quite a few more as well. And the idea of obviously bringing them in is to make sure that um, what is actually being proposed and orchestrated in terms of professional registration, OK, what they're trying to do with professional registration is make it relevant for the everyday world, be that industry, be it academia. OK. So let's talk about um, this uh, seminal pillar of professional registration um, itself. OK. So professional re registration with the Science Council provides independent recognition of your achievements. OK. And as I've said, I think historically there has been a need for this independent recognition because certainly within the context of universities, I think the sort of meal ticket, and I say this from a lot of experience, is a PhD. Now, many people with PhDs don't go on and use them, but at least there is essentially a chance that if you get a PhD, you will actually uh, come into a job at a certain level. OK, and if you pursue an academic career, sort of commensurate with your PhD in the UK in higher in higher education, you'll start at band seven. So this is a respectable salary with respectable job aims. That's hitherto been missing um, from uh, for, for technicians. OK, um, some of whom lack PhDs, although many of whom now do have them. So what I'd say is historically there's been an absence of accreditation for technicians translating into a substantive career pathway. OK, and the idea of professional registration that's promulgated by the Science Council in conjunction with specialist licensed bodies that administer this award, OK, on behalf of the Science Council um, is that you basically recognise different skills that technicians bring to bear and utilise in their jobs okay and i'll talk more about what those skills or competencies are in a minute so it's not an academic qualification it's very much a vocationally driven thing that's designed to um, look at competency in the workplace and also give potential employers if someone has professional registration confidence that that person can actually work to a certain level competently and with aptitude, OK, and has certain skills, knowledges and behaviour, KBEs as they're called. So that makes it similar. The award of professional registration by the Science Council, OK, to STEM scientists in the main is reminiscent. It's similar in a way to the award of chartered engineering by the Engineering Council, OK. The only other thing I'd say with regard to this slide is obviously technicians have a plethora of skills and a plethora of experience. And so when this award was, when this registration scheme was set up, which I think was 2015, 16, it has to reflect the fact that essentially you want an award that matches the skills, knowledge, and often responsibility of different cohorts of technicians, raising, ranging from our side tech, who have about a one year's experience um, post university or one year within a professional workplace, regardless of whether they've been to university. RSI, who have two years experience and are a little bit more independent, as I'll elaborate on in a second. And finally, CSI, who occupy the more sort of senior managerial technical roles. And I'll sort of talk about the prerequisites of those three registers, as they're called in a second. OK, so this is basically a slide that just emphasizes the fact that technicians uh, are working in higher education and um, industry in a variety of roles and utilising a variety of different skills in their everyday role. But the idea with professional registration as it's set up by the Science Council and administered through its different specialist technical bodies is that regardless of skills or background, if someone is, say, an RSI or an RSI tech, they will be working to the same standards, irrespective of uh, the discipline. OK. And the other thing I'd say about this is it's actually a voluntary registration and it's actually set up in such a way that people like myself are responsible for the assessment. OK, so it's actually your peers that assess you. OK, people who have an insight into the actual jobs themselves actually assess the professional um, applications. OK, so in that sense, it's got to be relevant. 
And the, sta the, the standards that the Science Council, the bootstrap statements linked to competences that the Science Council use are therefore very much rooted in um, what people actually do at the coal, coal face. So it, it meets that sort of uh, hitherto problem of being accountable and also relevant. So these skills, our competences, are broken down into five areas. OK. And the idea with these five areas is to sort of set this apart. From an academic qualification. So professional registration looks holistically at the whole person. So, for example, um, there is a section where you talk shop knowledge and understanding. That's actually um, looking at um, that's actually looking at knowledge that you apply to science, applying concept to unexpected situations or evaluating scientific ideas to improve troubleshoot or optimize concept. So that's really uh, competency A is really the one that addresses the sort of technical needs. But of course, we bring so much more to the workplace than our technical knowledge. We plan, we organize, we communicate with different groups of people. And that's sort of recapitulated in these other competencies. So let's take competency B, responsibility. That's about autonomous practice, limits of practice, and how many people depend on you. It's about safe working practices and COSH, compliance with regulatory regulations. It's also about planning work. Interpersonal and communication skills, that's about how you communicate, not just with your fellow peers in a technical sense, but also uh, people from outside the workplace that you communicate with. OK, and that's a particular issue for, say, the higher registers like RSI and RSI um, and CSI. Where you might be talking to people in finance, you may be talking to engineers in terms of the platforms that are used in the labs. OK, so it's talking about how you use your communication skills, the tools you use. OK, the mode in which you communicate to these different constituent groups, but also how you problem solve within groups and generally in situation. OK, so it looks at those sorts of existential problems in the workplace. D, professional practice is about reviewing and selecting procedures, scoping and planning projects for the higher registers like CSI. It's about how you organize your work, how you, how you actually prosecute what you do in terms of considering your tasks and resources. And finally, the other sub-competency, as it's called, of professional practice is what you personally do to actually procure change and improvement in your workplace to make things in the context of your day job run better. Professionalism is really synonymous with CPD, so I won't talk about that. I've mentioned the fact that we have these three registers. Now, unfortunately, um, what's actually happened here is I set this up uh, in PowerPoint um, and I was going to use animation and I wasn't aware of the fact, so apologies, folks, that there's no animation. This is a fixed PDF. So things were going to move off the R sign, C sign synopsis. So let me perhaps therefore um, go on to. OK, let me go back to that. Um, so essentially, if we were to define what an R side tech is and apologies, you cannot see the bootstrap statement for R side or C side. So an R side, in essence, is somebody who um, has one year's experience so they're not a rookie they are competent they can actually function independently in the context of prescribed sops but they wouldn't necessarily based on the fact that they only have one year's experience they wouldn't necessarily be expected to actually troubleshoot or train others okay um, they don't have they may have but they're not expected in their job spec to actually um, be um, improvising on standard operating procedures or training others in health and safety. OK, so that generally is someone who's been in the workplace one year, is competent in the context of a pres prescribed procedure, but is really not expected to actually go outside the bounds of that procedure in order to troubleshoot or innovate. And by the same token, they tend not to uh, troubleshoot and innovate with regard to analytical platforms that are used in the workplace and also are not at least expected um, in terms of the award to demonstrate that they are training others. 
if you contrast that with our side, this is someone essentially who may have started as an R type, R side tech and progressed on. So if we were to sort of talk about the seminal difference between an R side and a C side, it is the fact that an R side not only works independently in the context of a prescribed SOP, but may have written that SOP and may have other tricks up their sleeve through two or more years experience. That tends to be the threshold, two years or more experience. So they can improvise on a standard prescribed SOP if problems are involved, if they encounter, they troubleshoot, okay? They also tend in the main to train other technicians or other PhD students. And that isn't just re with regard to, um, that isn't just with regard to the actual technical knowledge that's required to carry out a particular wet-based te technique, okay, or an IT-based form of analysis of data, okay. It's, it's also with regard to the health and safety edicts that, of course, are absolutely paramount and mandatory in a 21st century workplace, particularly labs, where you can be using a lot of uh, dangerous equipment or noxious chemicals. Finally, a CSI is someone that has five or more years experience, okay? And let me just say there are two types of CSIs. One is a lab manager, and one is basically um, what I refer to as a line manager. So a lab manager would be somebody like me that doesn't actually have um, line, manage, line manager in their job title with a commensurate um, pay grade, okay? Um, they're still at band five or six. But the crucial difference between an RSI and a CSI, who is a lab manager, is apart from training people and actually having more input in the general running of the lab, as lab manager would imply, the crucial difference, one of the crucial differences is this. They supervise as opposed to train. So let me take that dichotomy of supervision and training. With an RSI, they would be expected to demonstrate on their competency form that they actually um, train somebody. That is, they train them in the requisites of health and safety and the technical knowledge required to carry out a particular practical endeavor. Then they let them go. And in terms of what actually happens, downstream um, experiments, evaluating the data, deciding what's going to do next, that isn't something that an RSI necessarily would be expected to do. In order to be a CSI, however, if you're not a line manager, in other words, if you're not managing teams of people, you can be a CSI by virtue of supervision. So how does supervision differ from um, training? Well, I think that's sort of implied in what I've said before. Somebody that supervises isn't just training them in the initial techniques. They're actually following through with that person. They're looking at the data they generate, okay? They're looking at the problems and the quality linked to that data. And based on what the findings are, they're helping that person design new experiments. That's bench supervision as opposed to um, sort of nominal training. And that takes you into the realms of CSI as a lab manager, even if you're not a line manager and managing teams. OK, so the competency report itself, we're coming towards the end of the talk now. So essentially, I haven't really got time to go into this in detail, but as I've said to you, um, at the beginning, I offer workshops on behalf of the Science Council, which actually are much more bespoke and break this down in terms of how you actually compile a competent competency answer, as I call it. And moreover, I give examples within these bespoke workshops, which I'm going to offer as a sequel to this within this series that you can actually reflect on and say, oh, yes, I do that. Or, oh, yeah. I can see that's analogous to something I can do. So that can be a case study for my own personal competency report. So I personalize it in a way that I haven't been able to do today. But essentially, um, as you can see from here, you take one to three case studies, usually from the last five years. And for each of your sub competencies for basically A to E with essentially three, so 16 in total, you would expect to put down 300 to 1,000 words. So somewhere around about five to 10,000 words in total. So it's not a trivial exercise, okay? It is something you should and can take your time over. Okay, so to conclude the talk, what I've tried to do here is give you a schematic of the competencies I've mentioned, okay? Knowledge and understanding, A. Personal responsibility, B. 
interpersonal skills and communication C and professional practice D. And what I've tried to do with this is delineate the three main constituents of the three registers, R-Side Tech, r -Side, c -Side. So if we look at a typical r -Side Tech with one year's experience, they're following COSH prescribed forms, okay? They're following prescribed SOP. But the other thing, of course, well, not of course, but the other thing you can do as um, in terms of, of submitting this competency form is it doesn't have to just be wet based lab work. You can talk about a literature review in terms of knowledge and understanding, filling out that particular competency. OK, sort of basically working up or learning existing methods in the case of an R side tech and getting those getting your supervisor to give you the nod. OK, so it can be a literature review, not not just um, lab based work, although that's what most people tend to do. The other thing I'd say is I've shown you a cartoon here of someone with a Gilson and a, a box of tips. OK, but of course, most, in fact, all professional labs today are not like school chemistry labs. It isn't just tips and glassware. It's very sophisticated platforms that you use to actually carry out the experiments. So as an art side tech, you will probably be using, like everybody else, some of those platforms, some of those platforms to carry out experiments. As an r -side tech, you would probably be expected to maintain them, but not necessarily improve or innovate on platform methods. OK, the other part of um, component of an r -side tech's lab, um, and this is regardless of discipline, you tend to stop take an order on behalf of the lab. There tends to be lab housekeeping duties as well just as cleaning, disposal of waste, tip recycling. OK, and these are all the subject of other competencies such as B, C and D. OK, these are things that an R side tech, regardless of whether they're biomedical scientists or chemists, would typically do to keep the lab running uh, on behalf of other people. In addition to personal bench work themselves, which is covered to some extent by A, but also by B, C and D. OK. And then the other thing I'd say is actually balancing these two sets of seminal responsibilities for anyone in the lab, including our side tech, is part of the planning, which you talk about in D. It's also part of how you um, how autonomous you are and what you do. So that is B. OK, so I think the name of the game is the competency forms by virtue of these four uh, Competencies in particular, A to D, address all aspects of what technicians at all grade would actually bring to their job. So this really recapitulates the last slide, but in the context of our size. So let me just point, point out seminal differences alluding to what I said earlier. So in terms of personal bench work, you as an R side tech and in terms of filling out these competencies here, A, B, C and D, you might implement health and safety perform independent experiments. OK, you might also troubleshoot and improve on equipment. Lab management would involve setting up rotors for other people and actually managing those two sets of responsibilities would be something that there again is covered by competencies B and D. And finally, this is the same thing for a line manager where you're working in the context of teams. And I'll just say, Katie, I'm about to finish. Um, if you'd like a copy of this talk, I think this would be useful because it provides you with links to certain materials, but also the schematics of the cartoons. And if you take my details, I have these other talks, which I intend to present at some point that will give you a lot more background information, bespoke information for each respective register that I haven't been able to provide today. OK, I was going to talk about um, employer champions. Um, and also um, the fact that we offer um, bespoke workshops and you might say that's innovation, but that's something that we can have a conversation about now or we can talk about subsequently because I think I've just run out of time. So at that point, I always put this slide up because it gives you for each of the three registers on the left hand side, the level, the experience required and just as crucially, the cost that either you will incur in terms of applying for professional registration and membership of an associated society, or say in the case of an organization that's committed at a higher level to employer championship status with the Science Council, 
one of the things that that does is the employers find it for you. So if you just take a look at that slide and I'm going to say thank you very much and I hope that that has proved useful. I'm going to now hand back to Katie. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lawrence. I'm sure um, a lot of the attendees will agree that that was really useful, insightful um, and a lot of what you were sort of talking about at the beginning of the presentation, I'm sure will resonate with a lot of the technical um, attendees that are here. We've had you had someone on the chat saying that, you know, now they do the skilled work and the bottle washing. They work in longer hours um, and they keep doing it because um, people think they can and it's it can be exhausting. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of what you've said will really resonate with people. And um, we do have some time for some questions before. OK. I run through those questions. I'm just going to publish um, the final poll. Um, yeah. And it's just about whether or not you found the um, session useful, but we've got lots of different uh, um, polls. But before we go through those, if we've got time, we can run through the results of those after. Um, there are just a few questions that I'd like to ask you. Um, so we've got one question which um, says, is it realistic to assume that because 70,000 techs per year are leaving the tech community, that a similar number needs to be recruited? I think the answer is based on the way that um, we're moving towards an increasingly technological economy. I would say yes, and I would say and then some. So yes, but it really is predicated on the idea that technicians will be integral to performing skilled duties, okay? Remember, what a technician offers is often practical knowledge that um, academics don't have. And part of the reason they don't have it um, is because they're not so interested. They tend to be focused on their theoretical models of cancer or the structure of their isomers if they're chemists, okay? Technicians are often more motivated by the actual practical endeavor itself in many ways, there is much artisans as academics. I say academics because many of us technicians are very highly qualified and we're high achievers at school. But I would I would say that probably applies to me. But I would say I'm less interested in the academic models and more interested in actually generating data in a higher educational context, which after all is what you need. You've got to have the raw data to build the models. But regardless of what the application of um you know, your practical endeavour is, your skill, you, you do need technicians in the mix because they're the ones that tend to actually sort of become sort of integral in terms of running pieces of equipment in higher education and outside. They're the gurus, the go-to persons. And as we become increasingly more of a knowledge-based economy, particularly in things like biomedical sciences um, and other things like um, AI, um, biodiversity and climate science and you know the UK based on the structure of its universities the way it's funded you know it's it's well placed to sort of lead that initiative really in conjunction with America so I would say not just 70,000 but more but it really is predicated on the sorts of things I've talked about today whether technicians increasingly become particularly in permanent jobs bottle washers or whether they're sort of skilled practitioners of science Perfect, thank you. And we've got another question here, um, and it's about the numbers of registrants at the moment per category for professional registration. Do you have those numbers? Um, I actually, I do you know, I don't have those numbers. I tend to sort of not get involved in those things. But all I can say, and I hope this isn't a cop out, is that if you drop me a line, because I'm a mentor, um, part of the Science Council extended team, there are people at the Science Council who are part of the central team, people like Jane Banks and Hayley McNeil, that will have those numbers to hand. So if you drop me a line, I can get you those numbers by uh, touching base with Hayley or Jane. OK, great. Um, third question. Um, how do you think we can help bring these competencies into FE um, for people wanting to enter this industry? Um. That's a good question, actually. Um, I think it really is about um, promotion. It's one of the things that uh, one of the seminal pillars of the technician commitment is we need to talk about what technicians do. And I think by extension, what needs to be done and the accreditation that they um, need to be given through professional registration. So I think the mechanism is there. 
as one of my fellow mentors who I know is here today, Stephen Franny, um, will probably concur. I don't know if Stephen's allowed to talk, but I know that Stephen thinks one of Stephen's um, one of Stephen's thing that Stephen says is that it's surprising how many academics have not heard of the Science Council and by extension, um, professional registration for technicians. And that's probably true of the people that uh, run further education colleges. So it's essentially it's about it's about it's about sort of educating people. It's about getting the word out there. One of the issues with promotion of uh, technician commitment, it seems to me, is it's almost like we're preaching to the converted. We're preaching to people who actually can see the benefits of this. But what we really need to do is preach to the people higher up the food chain who actually uh, control the purse strings. And I think that is a challenge and it is about promoting through the Science Council, through government, whatever uh, social media platforms, whatever way you can. It's about getting those people who fund um, sort of technical training in further education colleges or who employ technicians in industry and higher education. It's getting them on board in terms of the message and the mechanisms. And by mechanisms, I mean the technician commitment, in particular professional registration. Spreading the word, in a nutshell. Yeah, right. Uh, I think this is our last question. Um, so I'll quickly ask you this one. Um, just to confirm for everyone that's on this webinar, um, it will be recorded. So as the webinar finishes, you'll be sent a um, a replay link so that you can watch it, share it with your colleagues. Um, and we also host all of the webinars for up to a year after. Um, so if you go to the Lab Innovations website, and um, there's a link in the chat here, um, and you can watch all the different um, webinars that we've hosted. Um, so uh, one other question, I think we've probably got time for two more questions. Um, yeah, I'm happy to chat. Cool. So um, where's the ideal place for a technician to improve um, his or her skills? Is it industry, university and why? OK, um, that's a contentious one, isn't it? Because I think let me just say I know a lot of people that um, go from university to industry because, of course, the name of the game in industry, it's about developing a product and selling it. So I think by nature of the business, it's more in line with the sort of practical endeavours that technicians value. So I think in some ways, industry can be a better place for technicians. Um, so I would say at the moment, perhaps, and this is very contentious, perhaps industry is a better place to get trained and recognised. But that said, I don't want to um, actually negate in that regard higher education because after all it's where most technicians are and they will need to be a big part of the mix going forward and what i'd say sadly and this is based on somebody that's worked the length and breadth of the uk and also had the um the sort of if you like the benefit of of seeing how things are done in europe and north america so i bring a lot of experience and perspective to the table and what i'd say personally it really depends on and this is part of the challenge within universities in particular is it's very capricious. It really depends upon your supervisor, your, you know, your, your PI. Um, some are very on board with technicians and very progressive. Um, and I've worked for those equally. I've worked for one or two um, that haven't. So whilst I'd say that in terms of quality control and training and the sorts of things that are really teased out by professional registration by the technician commitment they're probably more common in industry it's a better fit in some ways that isn't to say that as a more academic technician you can't have a fulfilled role in higher education with the right sort of progressive supervisor it really is about the person you work for the pi that brings in the grant and i've had some that have been wonderful where I felt challenged and well trained. And, you know, and let me just say that universities um, have actually, you know, they're signatories to this thing called the technician commitment. I didn't really go into that as part of that. They're paying for at least one year of professional registration. So the, the big players in that regard, if you look at the numbers, most of those are 
the Russell Group universities. OK, so they are doing things for their technicians, but they've got a long way to go. Hence the need for talks like this and the sort of structures that um, I, I've talked about. Um, so I would say, in essence, um, both. But it is very much a personal fit. And I think to an extent in higher education in particular, who you end up working for. I've worked for people who have given me a really good run, um, have sent me on courses, and I've worked for others, to put it bluntly, who have sucked. Um, and you tend not to stay with them long. And I'll say no more than that. Great. OK, I'm just going to ask um, one more question. I've seen we've had a few that have come in, but what I can do is, um, Lawrence, I can link you up with the attendees and sure. after seat that you can answer those um, another time. But just before we go, um, one more question. Um, and that's there are so many technicians in the NHS. Why are we restricting um, it to higher education? I'll tell you why that is. Um, and I'm not an expert on this, but um, the Institute of Biomedical Sciences and, and there may be people in the audience that know more about this and might disagree with me. But I think for, for many years, they've had their own um, training structures, their own portfolios. And I know one thing, actually, when when the actual sort of nuanced details and mechanics of professional registration was set up. And this was by people like Kelly Veer in about 2015, 16. To some extent, they were actually inspired by the NHS in terms of of the training courses they have. And this is why this tends to, professional registration in the context of the Science Council tends to lend itself more to technicians in industry and higher education that are registered through things like the RSB and the IST. And NHS technicians tend to do their own thing, but I think they do their own thing because they've always been ahead of the curve compared to say, um, academic and hefty funded technicians in universities. I'm going to say no more because it's not something I'm an expert on. OK, great. Well, um, yeah, as I said, if you do have a question that's unanswered, we can always um, link you up with Lawrence Direct. But I just want to say another massive thank you um, to Lawrence for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for attending um, today's talk. So we'll have one um, in a few weeks time, which will um, be on the secrets of successful limbs configuration. So we'll write to you about that in the time being. But um, again, thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, and yeah, if you haven't already answered the polls, please make sure you um, go and do that now. But thanks nice for doing that now. And uh, stay safe, take care. Thanks thank a lot. You. Likewise, Katie, it's my, been my thank pleasure. You. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye.